The Mark VI self-contained underwater breathing apparatus offers advantages in both depth and duration of dive with less decompression when mixtures of oxygen and nitrogen are used. Although mixtures of helium and oxygen may be used in the Mark VI, they offer no decompression advantages. We will therefore concern ourselves only with the oxygen-nitrogen mixture. The Mark VI is a semi-closed scuba. Not all of the exhaled gas is exhausted. Some of it is circulated for rebreathing. Safe and successful use of the Mark VI demands that you plan each dive, that you follow the prescribed procedures, and that you take proper care of the apparatus after each use. In this film, you will see how the Mark VI scuba operates and how you carry out the various procedures, pre-dive, dive, post-dive, post -dive, and maintenance. Out of the water, the Mark VI weighs about 70 pounds, most of it, of course, due to the cylinders and backplate. The backplate assembly and the vest assembly, the gear's two major parts, are readily separated by disconnecting canister hoses, differential gauge hoses, and pulling the toggle pin. Attached to the vest assembly are the breathing bags, exhaust valve, mouthpiece, and breathing hoses. Two additional hoses connect the breathing bags and the back plate assembly. It includes a single canister containing carbon dioxide absorbent, flanked by the two high pressure gas cylinders, which contain a properly proportioned mixture of oxygen and nitrogen, a manifold, a manifold shutoff valve, a pressure regulator, and a control block, which contains valves that meter the volume of gas flowing into the system. Now let's see how the gases flow in the system. Actually, there are two systems, one for gas delivery, the other for rebreathing. The cylinders are charged with a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen at a pressure of 3,000 pounds per square inch. When the manifold shutoff valve and the control block on-off valve are opened, the gas flows from the cylinders through the manifold and its valve, then through the constant mass flow regulator, which is, in effect, a pressure-reducing valve. This valve operates automatically, depending on a spring and seawater pressure. The regulator mechanism includes a nozzle assembly that functions as a variable orifice, a diaphragm, bellows containing the main regulator spring, and a spring button for setting the force of the spring. The outlet pressure of the regulator is set to prescribed values ranging from 80 to 180 pounds per square inch, depending on the planned depth for the dive. From this regulator, the gas flows through the control block, which meters it for the desired flow rate. The block contains four valves. One is an on-off valve. When it is turned on, the gas flows through it and through a resistor orifice, then through an adjustable needle valve, past a spring-loaded check valve, and out of the block. The combined action of the needle valve and the regulator results in a constant mass flow of gas. A differential pressure gauge is part of the control block assembly. One line to the gauge permits gas that is upstream of the orifice to flow to the gauge. The other gauge line takes gas from the downstream side of the orifice. The pointer shows the pressure drop or differential pressure across the orifice 
indicating any change in gas flow. The block also contains a bypass valve that is manually controlled. When this valve is opened, gas flows directly from the regulator and out of the block. The flow seats the check valve, stopping the normal flow through the on-off valve and the needle valve. The gas delivered by the bypass valve is delivered unrestrictedly to the control block to canister hose. By closing the bypass valve, the normal flow of gas is restored. Gas leaving the control block flows into the canister hose leading to the inhalation breathing bag. From here, it flows through the inhalation hose to the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece contains two check valves. They ensure a positive directional flow of gases as you inhale and exhale. The gas from your lungs, which contains some carbon dioxide, flows through the exhalation hose and into the exhalation breathing bag. Part of this gas is exhausted through the exhaust valve. The gas that is not exhausted flows to the canister and travels between the outer and inner shells through the carbon dioxide absorbent for removal of the carbon dioxide. The purged gas then passes into the canister hose and mixes with fresh gas coming from the cylinders. The mixture then proceeds to the inhalation breathing bag, then to the mouthpiece, repeating the circulation cycle. The Mark VI, with its semi-closed rebreathing system, conserves gas and offers advantages in both depth and duration of dive. The depth dictates the proportion of oxygen and nitrogen, regulator pressures, and flow rates that must be used. In dives down to 80 feet, the percentage of oxygen is 60% and nitrogen 40%. Regulator pressure must be set at 80 pounds per square inch. The liter flow at 8 liters per minute and the resistor orifice is a number 8. In a dive depth range of 140 to 180 feet, the gas mixture is 32.5% oxygen and 67.5% nitrogen. Regulator pressure, 180 pounds per square inch. The liter flow is 21 liters per minute, and the number 21 resistor orifice is used. These values are given in the Mark VI manual. Warning, you must not dive deeper than the limit for the settings you have made. To do so invites the possibility of oxygen poisoning. Now let's see the pre-dive procedures that you must follow. If they seem detailed, remember, safe, successful dives depend on thorough preparation. Let's start from scratch. Charging the gas cylinder. First, unthread the canister hoses. Disconnect the control block to canister hose at the gas inlet block. Remove the cylinder spreader bar. This releases the canister assembly. Next, remove the regulator and control block assembly, disconnecting the bypass valve linkage and the differential pressure gauge hoses. Remove the regulator yoke assembly from the manifold. 
The cylinders are now ready for charging. Hook up the gas transfer pump to the cylinders. Avoid all contact with oil and grease. Explosions can occur if oil and high pressure oxygen come into contact. Charge the cylinders to 3,000 pounds per square inch with the desired gas mixture. If the cylinders are to be stored rather than used immediately, tag them. Note the exact composition of the gas mixture, the pressure, and the date of charging. Now, to charge the canister. First, remove the cover assembly. Then the internal screen. Inspect the screen for possible damage or clogging. Replace it in the canister, smooth side down. Use the filling collar. It prevents the carbon dioxide absorbent from dropping between the inner and outer shells. About six pounds of absorbent is required. When you pour it, hold the container six to eight inches above the canister so that any dust will blow away. Fill the canister about one third. Tap it lightly to settle the absorbent. Fill to two-thirds, tap again. Fill to about a quarter of an inch from the top. Install the canister cover. Finally, check the gasket to see that it fits properly. Remove the resistor orifice and its gasket from the control block. With the number up, check the orifice for proper size and for possible damage. The gasket must be installed when the orifice is replaced. Remember the access cap. To reassemble the back plate assembly, first secure the regulator and control block assembly to the cylinder manifold by connecting the yoke assembly. Secure the bypass linkage. Now install the canister assembly. There's a lug on the canister that secures it to the back plate. Replace the cylinder spreader bar.
make sure that the gaskets are in place. Connect the canister hoses to the breathing bags. The next step in the pre-dive procedures is to make the proper pressure and gas flow settings. Be sure the manifold shutoff valve and the control block on-off valve are off. Work the bypass valve to relieve all pressure on the regulator. With an Allen wrench, back off the regulator spring button fully counterclockwise. Do not attempt to back off on the spring while the regulator is pressurized. The differential gauge fittings on the control block must be plugged. Connect the control block to canister hose to the pressure gauge. Open the manifold shutoff valve slowly Then turn the on-off valve on. To allow gas to flow, loosen the jam nut and back off the needle valve slightly. Now adjust the regulator by turning the spring button clockwise until the desired pressure is reached. In this case, 80 pounds. To adjust the liter flow, make sure the on-off valve is off and the manifold shutoff valve is open. With the jam nut loosened, turn the needle valve slowly until it bottoms gently. Remove the pressure gauge. Connect the control block to canister hose to the flow meter. Turn on the on-off valve. Next, back off the needle valve, pressing it down at the same time to hold it as the jam nut will hold it when retightened. When the desired flow rate is reached, tighten the jam nut and wait two minutes. Turn off the on-off valve and with the flow meter disconnected, work the bypass valve several times. Recheck both pressure and liter flow. There must be no change in either. Turn the on-off valve off. Install the differential pressure gauge. Turn the on-off valve on. The gauge should read within the safe area. Now disconnect the flow meter. Reconnect the control block to canister hose. Work the bypass valve and recheck the differential pressure gauge. If the pointer remains in the safe area, turn the on-off valve off. Now, check the mouthpiece check valves. First, set the mouthpiece valve to the dive position. Test the exhalation check valve by squeezing the inhalation hose shut. Now, gently try to inhale. If you can't, 
it means that the exhalation check valve is working properly. If you can inhale, the exhalation check valve is faulty and must be replaced. To check the inhalation check valve, squeeze the exhalation hose shut and try to exhale. If you can't exhale, the inhalation check valve is working properly. To check for any leaks in the apparatus, place the mouthpiece valve to the surface position. Check that the bag drain plugs are in place and see that the exhaust valve is closed. Now turn the on-off valve on. Inflate the breathing bags by operating the bypass valve. Submerge the inflated rig in water. Any bubbles except from the exhaust valve, indicate leaks, which must be eliminated. Tighten the straps to your own comfort. Check the drain plugs. They're easy to forget. Set the mouthpiece valve to dive, then recheck the inhalation and exhalation check valves. Turn the on-off valve on. Check each other's rig before entering the water. See that the differential pressure gauge reading is proper. Recheck for leaks or other malfunctions just below the surface. While descending, use the bypass valve to keep the breathing bags properly inflated. Adjust the exhaust valve to maintain proper bag inflation. To correct for overinflation, use the pull grip to dump excess gas by fully opening the exhaust valve. Before ascending from the working level to the first decompression stop, purge the breathing bags. Repeat the purge before you leave each decompression stop. This reestablishes the proper oxygen-nitrogen percentage during decompression. After use, the apparatus must be rinsed in clean, fresh water. Remove the drain plugs and allow the bags to drain. Check the condition of the exhaust valve. Remove the canister. Discard the carbon dioxide absorbent. Rinse the canister thoroughly. Allow it to dry. Examine the regulator and the control block assembly for possible signs of trouble. After inspection and reassembly, the rig is again ready for pre-dive procedures.
Maintenance should be performed after 10 to 15 hours of use or before the rig is to be stowed for a considerable time. Disassemble the rig into its various components. All parts must be cleaned, inspected, and replaced if necessary. Wash and dry the breathing bags with the exhaust valve removed. Wash and inspect the parts of the exhaust valve. Replace parts if necessary. Carefully examine the mouthpiece and hose assembly. Wash the parts with surgical soap. Closely inspect the check valves. They should be free of distortion. Disinfect all parts in accordance with latest BUMED instructions. Separate the regulator from the control block. Remove the cover plug from the resistor orifice and the ball check valve of the control block. Inspect the threads. Check the O-ring gaskets. Lubricate them with Floralube. Remove and inspect the bypass valve. Now, the needle valve. Replace them if there are signs of corrosion or wear. After disassembly of the regulator, visually inspect the aneroid. Place the aneroid in a pan of warm water to check for leaks. Inspect the diaphragm for any distortion. Check the Teflon gasket for damage. Replace any parts as necessary and reassemble the regulator. Disassemble the canister. Be careful not to damage the gaskets and the gas inlet block. Remove the inner canister. Scrub all parts thoroughly in fresh water. Dry the parts with compressed air or allow them to dry naturally. Inspect all parts, especially the screen and gaskets. Make replacements as necessary. Clean the parts of the spreader bar assembly. Lubricate them with Fluralube. Finally, lubricate the vest zipper also with Fluralube. After reassembly, leave the mouthpiece valve in the dive position. Back off the regulator spring. Leave the canister hoses disconnected. Open the exhaust valve fully. Make sure the drain plugs are removed.
The Mark VI is now ready for stowage or for the pre-dive procedures required when preparing for a diving operation. If you take good care of your Mark VI scuba, then it will take good care of you.